Um, I will just get stuck in uh, right away in that case. I quote, I've lately heard there's nothing finer than the Isle of Arran, memoir of a sketching trip circa 1850. My paper today is based around ongoing research that I'm doing into documents in the archives of the Royal Scottish Academy. Purely by chance, part of this has an Arran connection, and this is what I've decided to share, or I've been allowed to share with you this afternoon. At the moment, I'm midway through my research, and like so many other people, it's got a bit stymied thanks to the restrictions because of the pandemic. And I am still searching for sketches of Aaron by the artists whom you are about to meet. In 1904, at the end of a very long and productive career, the painter James Archer presented a small collection of items from his personal library to the Royal Scottish Academy. Among them were two notebooks described as extended minutes of a sketching club established in Edinburgh in 1848. Although the books are anonymous and bear no dates, the author is identified as the donor, James Archer. His text takes the form of a play in a succession of six acts per notebook. Written in black ink with some pencil additions, it is mostly in unrhymed verse, although there is a bit of doggerel as well. Volume one recalls meetings of the club in Edinburgh between 1848 and about 1853, and volume two covers the period when the club was reinstated in London in 1863. Volume one opens with a theatrical style cast of characters headed up the art students. They are listed in alphabetical order by their club names with their real names appended in pencil. We read Anson, James Archer, Butterworth, John Ballantyne, Crichton, William Crawford, Davidson, William Fettis Douglas, John Finlay, John Fade and Tom Finlay, John's wee brother, Thomas Fade. And the two names at the bottom aren't relevant to my paper today. They join the club later on. And here we meet three of the members in person. On the left, John Fade. In the middle, John Ballantyne. And on the right hand side, William Fettis Douglas, sketched as young men by the, uh, their friend and co club member, John Fade. In 1848, the founder members were young. They ranged in age from 22 to 33 years. They lived in Edinburgh and had studied at the Trustees Academy, which was the only public art school in Scotland at the time. And by 1848, Ballantyne and Crawford were already teaching there. And here we meet Crawford and John Fade, but slightly later in life. I'm afraid no, no pictures available of them as young men. These men were also beginning to exhibit in the RSA annual exhibitions. And Ballantyne and Fade were already associates of the RSA and the rest would follow suit between 1850 and 1860. Thus, we meet six young men early in their careers and keen for self-improvement. They founded the Smashers Club in 1848 to address this ambition and its premise was simple. Each member of the club would take a turn to host a meeting during which the artists produced sketches on a given theme and then critiqued each other's work. Afterwards, they dined well, took plenty of refreshment and engaged in lively discussion, banter and song. Towards the end of the first act in this memoir, plans are made to break from the established routine. Summer is approaching and the end of the season. Archer proffers a toast. Here's the doggerel. So here it is to our meeting again in the bright open air and the sun. We have only to fix the where and the when, and then we may have some fun. And William Douglas, that is Douglas suggests, I have lately heard from one who has been there that of all the places that are not too far, there's nothing finer than the Isle of Arran. William Crawford agrees. I know it well, it is most picturesque and the rest concur. They arranged to set off tomorrow week, apparently, and this is probably, in fact, about 1850 when they took this trip. By 1850, Aaron was already a destination for artists. Among those who had already been there was James Skeen of Rubislaw. 
A very well connected man of many parts, he was based in Edinburgh and amongst other things was a highly skilled amateur artist. With a special interest in antiquities and geology, and here are some images of his work on the screen, he recorded the places he visited in watercolours and his work may well have been known in Edinburgh to our young artists. Horatio McCulloch, on the other hand, was the trained and successful artist specialising in landscape. A Glasgow man, his first trip to Arran in around 1833 would have been a simple steamer ride away, but by 1846 he had settled in Edinburgh and he was getting known in Edinburgh as well. He exhibited Arran paintings in the RSA annual exhibitions in 1833 and 1846 and our artists will almost certainly have seen his work and may well have encountered him personally. Act two of the Smashers Club memoir opens by setting the scene. I quote, in the island of Arran at Brodick, the club, having arrived by steamer, standing on the quay. On arrival, Crawford directs his companions to a cottage where they will be staying. It is later referred to as Nuke Foot, but it doesn't give its location. Or there's no other more information on its location. He admits that it is small, like herring in a, in a barrel will be packed. And he adds that the catering is rustic. Here it is but Hobson's choice. Mutton it is today, mutton tomorrow. Anyway, they settle in and that evening the group takes a walk to Glen Rosa to select their sketching sites for the following day. In the morning, in the cottage before breakfast, the club are all assembled together and John Fade chivies them along. We're sitting much too long at Nukefoot now. Let us be off. The morning is too fine. Up with our sketchbooks and our camp stools too. Away to Rosa's Glen. Begin our work. And here on screen we see a, a drawing of Tom Fade dressed for the outdoors with tousled hair and a sketchbook to hand working away. Sometime later, the memoir reports, in Glen Rosa, after sketching for several hours, they take a break and examine each other's work, as they would do in Edinburgh in their evening sessions. Fettis Douglas observed, oh, what a glorious sketch you've made there, Tom, Tom Fade. So crisp and right and also true to tone. Watercolour beats me, I'm afraid. I must have oil to find myself at home. And Archer agrees, it's the same with me, I've made a mess of it, he says. John Ballantyne is also challenged, but for a different reason. He says, the landscape kept changing every hour. Of course, this is very unlike controlled studio conditions with a flat north light at all hours of daylight. Working directly in the countryside was not something that the members of the club would have had much experience of at this time, hence Ballantyne's struggle with the transient effects of light. At the time, the primary aim of the ambitious artist was to recreate grand themes from the Bible, history and literature, or to paint portraits. And see, for example, on the image on the screen, which shows an RSA exhibition hang with the favoured portraits, the subject paintings placed in the most favoured position on the line at eye line, in contrast to landscapes, which were often skied right up in the ceiling or floored right down on the skirting board. And they were harder to see and therefore much harder to sell. However, within a short time, landscape would earn its place alongside the most popular of the themes. But back to our chums on Aaron. Fettis Douglas was not persuaded to adopt landscape particularly at the time. His practice remained one of meticulously researched and constructed oil paintings of scenes from history and literature. For example, The Messenger of Evil Tidings, which is on your screen at the moment, a very carefully prepared, thought out and executed historical subject. Unsurprisingly, however, Tom's fade of the tousled hair was the artist who most relished working out of doors. This painting, executed about the same time as the Aaron trip, shows how easily Tom Fade 
integrated his figure groups into landscapes of dappled and transient light and shade. Indeed, landscape was to become an important element within his later work and around themes of country life and emigration. Sketching completed for the day. Sorry. Sorry, there we go. Sketching completed for the day. Sorry, I've just lost my face. There we go. Uh, the party returns to the cottage and a dinner of yet more mutton and they relax. Archer reckons, I've never spent a happier day than among the hills and with you, my friends, about me. Primarily a figure and portrait painter, Archer, unlike Fettus Douglas, did absorb experience of working in the open air. Later in his career, he incorporated landscape as an integral part of his portrait practice. See, for example, this portrait of Professor John Stuart Blackie on the screen. Blackie, amongst other achievements, had fundraised for a chair in Celtic studies at Edinburgh University. And Archer's painting of him here reflects Blackie's association with Scottish culture and Celtic heritage. Uh, also, there is a nod towards John Everett Millet's famous portrait of Ruskin. However, back on Aaron, Crawford reminds Archer of the pitfalls of landscape because of Sc the Scottish weather. When it pours, it, it is incessant for three weeks. We all know that one. And Ballantyne warns, your picture, i.e. your landscape, may not sell for what delights you most the public might not care to have at all. So where are you if you depend upon your art for your bread? And this is a timely reminder of the need to sell paintings to survive. And this is something that young artists without any other secure income would have been anxious to maintain. And in fact, John Ballantyne, for example, made a speciality of his own of painting artists in their studios. And here is one of a series that he did later in life. Um, this one, in fact, of one of the other Smashers Club, Tom Fade, in his studio in the 1860s. The evening on Aaron closes with a social sing-song. Ballantyne opens the singing with The Silver Tassie, a Jacobite ballad rewritten by Robert Burns. Fettis Douglas and Archer follow with Drink to Me Only With Thine Eyes, based on the poem to, to Celia by Ben Johnson. And John Fade closes with Mary Morrison, lyrics by Robert Burns. So there we go. The social side and the entertainment side of the Smashers Club. And thus the record of the Smashers Club trip to Aaron closes and our friends return to their city studios. However, this trip may have helped to encourage others to follow in their footsteps. Among the artists following on the heels of the Smashers Club was the Edinburgh-based painter Walla Hugh Payton. He worked on Aaron and from eight, just 1855, just five years later, he exhibited a substantial series of Aaron landscapes of which, which this fine Lamlash Bay one is, is one example. And I would just like to close at this point um, and let you enjoy this, this painting and I do apologise for the hiccups at the beginning and a bit of a gallop through this afternoon's paper as a result. Thank you for your patience.